When I was attending the West Side Los Angeles Vineyard in the late 1970s and early 80s, I was trying hard to be a really good Christian. I had experienced a genuine awakening of faith. I had begun to know the love of God, but I didn't realize that I was actually already one with Christ, that the Holy Spirit was intertwined with my spirit. So I was giving a tremendous amount of effort without the benefit of knowing Christ is my superpower. He's actually part of my being. His spirit is intertwined with mine. So in those days, Bill Bauer, who is of course part of this conversation today, uh, he was a major influence and help to me in understanding my union with Christ. Here's a few scriptures on that topic. Second Peter 1, everything we could ever need for life and godliness has already been deposited in us by his divine power. Through the power of these tremendous promises, we can experience partnership with the divine nature. We are in partnership with Christ. He's made his home in us. This is a huge key for Paul and for all of us. And of course, Jesus talks about the same thing, the vine branch union, our oneness with him. It's a mystery. Our, our union with Christ is a mystery in the same way that the union of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together as a trinity is also a mystery. It can't be fully understood by mere human ability. Uh, and so the way we grow in this is simply by meditating on this truth, accepting what is true, and letting God slowly unfold the reality of it in our lives. Paul writes to the Colossians, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of the mystery, which is the Greek word mysterion, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. How about you, Bill, with, with the whole longevity sticking to it? What are your words of wisdom on that? I think what eventually kept me going, Andy, was um, in the early days of the vineyard, Ken would s said a couple things. This is, even at this time, you know, I became a Christian, was so zealous yeah. for God. And, and uh, I always tell people I could go on forever about this or won't. But I, I made my attempts to be the unbelievable believer, to be the incredible Christian. Yeah. Which, not nothing really bad about that. I tried to love everyone, greet everyone, read my Bible, all good things, mm -hmm. and um, to try to get closer with God. To anyway, and I was slowly burning out. Yeah. And I and 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 not from Ken or Joni. They were really grace-filled pastors. But maybe I had a few friends that would kind of well. If you just do this more, you know, you'll you'll be able to get closer if you just do that. And I was, I come from an alcoholic family, and so that was difficult in in and of yeah. itself. Yeah. You know, but then you jump into the Christian life, and now you're going to try to be the perfect Christian and try to do all these things for Christ. And I was burning out, so I thought, oh. I, what am I going to do? Because the only hope is that somehow I can live this life, but I can't seem to do it. And uh, Ken all of a sudden said things like, uh, Christ is the real you. Mm -hmm. He's the real you in you. Yeah. And one time he said, I didn't know, and I, when he said these things, I, I said, oh, I kind of went off on me, but I didn't get it. And he said, one time he said, Christ is in you as you, as if it's you. Mm -hmm. So what's that? But yeah. I kind of, kind of liked it, and and um, shortly after that, I was kind of take a break from going to church and mm -hmm. the Christian scene, not from Jesus, but I just thought I can't do it anymore. And I found myself walking into that bookstore in Westwood. Uh, it was right near the Good Earth, mm -hmm. and uh, the last place I really was wanted to be was around Christian stuff. I just needed to take a break, and I saw this book on the on the shelf, and it said. And not I, but Christ. And what jumped out at me was the not I. I it seemed like it. At least it seemed like it. Or I was imagining it. And mm -hmm. The not I seemed. I thought, what's what's that? And I opened Watchman Nee's book, chapter twenty-seven. I remember probably the best chapter in the book. And Watchman Nee said this, and I'd never heard anyone say anything like this. He said, "The great news of the gospel 
is not only has he delivered you from death, he's delivered you from having to live. Not only did he die for you, but he lives for you. Amen. Mm. Not only is your he chokes me up. Not only is he your substitute in death, he's your substitute in life. And so through the rest of the chapter, he went on saying that he delivered me from living. Well, I've never heard anything like that. I I was just heard it's up to you to live, and this is what you got to do to do all this stuff. Yeah. And I couldn't do it. And then I you know ran into the scripture Christ in you, the hope of glory, and all yeah. of a sudden I thought, well, maybe there's one other answer and that's Jesus himself who can live the life through you that you can't live apart from Jesus yeah. and me said not only is the Christian life difficult it's impossible yeah <laughs> and there's only one person who can live it and that's Jesus Amen. through you yeah that gave me hope yeah a little hope and yeah and not much long after this is a real shortened version of all this stuff but right after that Norman Grubb Ken Gullickson invited Norman to the yeah. church, and Norman's opening line, and I was almost not going to be going to church for a while, and I was in the, the third row, and Norman came down. Now, he was always old to me. He was probably then in his 80s, yeah. but he, he was walking up, and he was kind of bent over from wartime wounds he had. He's walking up there, and he was always muttering, oh, <laughs> and I, I, I'm in the third row thinking, I wonder if I could slip out. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'm into this, you know. And so his opening, his opening line was, I never heard anything like this before. He said, it's never becoming something. Well, Norman would say it like this, it's, it's never becoming something. It's containing someone. Self-improvement is the greatest lie in the church today. Well, when he said that, you guys, it kind of went off of me. I thought, what was that? I've never heard anything like that. I, I, I didn't really get it, but it kind of kind of drew me in. And I, I kind of thought, I, I like that guy. I, I, I want to have what that guy has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what that is. Yeah. And uh, anyway, it's a long story up that, after that. And when he came to our home group, that's a whole other story. But uh, so I, I read a lot of his books and, and uh, later in life, traveled some with him. The great thing that occurred to me was it, it was trusting in the life of another. Yeah. And even Norman would say when all these vineyard pastors asked Norman, well, Norman, shouldn't we try to live the Christian life? Oh, no, my dear. Trying is the devil. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> and then he gave in Romans 7 that verse, when I would do good, the Apostle Paul says, when I would do good, evil is present with me. Yeah. Norman went on to say, well, why would the Apostle Paul say when he would do good evils? He said, because his good was evil. Trying to do good apart from Jesus, who's the only one who yeah. can do good and is good, Amen. is really the enemy trying to subst get you to substitute. Yes. Right. Yes. Anyway, so, and, and so the, the antithesis to the trying is it's by faith. Trusting. Yes. Trusting what mm -hmm. Paul said in Galatians 2.20 that it's no longer I that live, but Christ, Christ that lives in me, which I think is a, is a truth that many of us, we just sort of brush past that one, and we never really get it. Um, but what an incredible truth. And then you see that truth actually sprinkled throughout Paul's teachings mm. of being in union with Christ, you know, 1 Corinthians 6, 17, Mm -hmm. Right. Those who belong to the Lord are one spirit with him. And, yeah. and and then you see it in John 15, the vine and the branch, you know, one organism. And this is all like right in your wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. And 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 you you've taught me a lot about that. I mean, we even in those early days in the late 70s, I was able to show up to one of those Norman Grubb meetings only that I can remember but um, what you learn through that is how to live from a place of rest yeah mm -hmm. yeah. Right. right yeah. yeah trusting in the life of another trust yeah sometimes I'll tell people quit trying to live for God you need to realize that he lives for you and yeah. through you mm -hmm. yeah and so yeah I learned about yeah trusting in the life of another Andy and Christine yeah. and I think these two both get this stuff Totally, but 
that that gave me great hope to go on. Yeah, I could trust yeah. in him. Norman would always say, one of the I remember the vineyard pastor asked him, "Well, Norman, I'm just terrible. I'm just awful. I'm an awful, awful person. I can't get yeah. my act together." And he said, oh, sorry, I, no, I'm an for actor, it. so I was doing that. <laughs> oh, one wonderful, my dear. Uh, if you're a mess, tell him you're his mess, and it's his fault, and he better do a better job. I thought that was one of the best things I've ever heard, because I was a mess. That was one of the best things I'd ever heard in my life. Oh, I can trust you. The he he'd always say, keep the heat on God. Yeah. You know, don't yeah. throw it back on yourself to somehow try to improve yourself, fix, change, and rearrange yourself and other people. Trust Him to do that, the Holy Spirit to do that in people. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. And I, and I know a number of people who have left church because they felt like they couldn't be good enough. Hmm. And this is a huge key that I don't think they understood, that hey, it's not your righteousness, it's the righteousness of another. It, it's Christ's holiness, righteousness, wisdom. Mm. And I love your illustration on that subject, Bill. It was, it was Norman's, the, the coffee and the cup. Talk about that one a little bit. Yeah, well, that first time Norman came to the vineyard, that Ken had him come to the vineyard, and and um, <laughs> uh, Norman said, You're, it's, it's like a cup of coffee on the kitchen counter and we're the cup and he's the coffee but he said what's the major what's the major function he said what's the only function of the human and what's the function of the cup and I said I thought well he takes the coffee he said yes receptivity it receives the coffee it's not the cup's not running around in its own power having a source of its own power and doing something apart from the coffee the coffee is the power the power to produce, the power to do whatever. So the coffee is is the sanctification, the redemption, the wisdom, yeah. the life. But unfortunately, the cup is trying to be the coffee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so the cup is trying to be like the coffee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, of course, we, we do end up, says be imitators of Christ, we do end up looking maybe, by God's grace, more Christ-like, but it's really the coffee manifesting through through us mm -hmm. that make us yep. makes us look more Christ-like. It's not like you know. Something. Right, right. So he would say, "Bring that cup of coffee illustration up," and mm -hmm. and again it hit me. I thought, "What?" You know, and it kind of went off in me, although I didn't quite fully get it. Yeah. And it, then he brought up the branch and the vine. Yeah. You know, and and he said. <laughs> Of course, we, you know, we're, we're the branches, but he made an interesting statement. He said, you are the vine in branch form. I thought, what's that? Because I know he's not saying you're... And then I, you know, ran into the scripture, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And all of a sudden I thought, well, maybe there's one other answer, and that's Jesus himself, who can live the life through you that you can't live apart from Jesus. Yeah. And me said, not only is the Christian life difficult, it's impossible. Yeah. <laughs> and there's only one person who can live it, and that's Jesus. Amen. Through you. Yeah. That's right. So I, I, you know, that gave me hope. Yeah. You know, a little hope. And, yeah. And not much long after, this is a real shortened version of all this stuff, but right after that, Norman Grubb, Ken Gullickson invited Norman to the yeah. church, and Norman's opening line, and I was almost not going to be going to church for a while, and I was in the, the third row, and Norman came down now he was always old to me he was probably then in his 80s yeah but he he was walking up and he was kind of bent over from wartime wounds he had he's walking up there and he was always muttering oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and i thought I, i'm in the third row thinking i wonder if i could slip out i don't know <laughs> i don't know if i'm into this you know and so his opening his opening line was but well, norman would say it like this it's, it's never becoming something, it's containing someone. Self-improvement is the greatest lie in the church today. Well, when he said that, you guys, it kind of went off and I thought, what was that? I've never heard anything like that. I, I, I didn't really get it, but it kind of drew me in and I, I kind of thought, I, I like that guy. I, I, 
I want to have what that guy has. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what that is. <laughs> yeah. And uh, anyway, it's a long story up th after that. And when he came to our home group, that's a whole other story. But uh, so I, I read a lot of his books and, and uh, later in life traveled some with him. Uh, but uh, the great the great thing that occurred to me was it, it was trusting in the life of another. Yeah. And even Norman would say when the, all these vineyard pastors asked Norman, well, Norman, shouldn't we try to live the Christian life? Oh, no, my dear. Trying is the devil. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> and then he gave in Romans 7 that verse, when I would do good, the Apostle Paul says, when I would do good, evil is present with me. Yeah. And Norman went on to say, well, why would the Apostle Paul say when he would do good, evil is? He said, because his good was evil. Trying to do good apart from Jesus, who's the only one who yeah. can do good and is good, Amen. is really the enemy trying to get you to substitute. Yes. yes. Right. Yes. Anyway, so, and so, and so the, the antithesis to the trying is it's by faith. Trusting. Yes. Trusting what mm -hmm. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, that it's no longer I that live, but Christ, Christ that lives in me. Sin. Which I think is a, is a truth that many of us, we just sort of, brush past that one and we never really get it um, but what an incredible truth and then you see that truth actually sprinkled throughout Paul's teachings mm. of being in union with Christ you know 1 Corinthians 6 17 those who belong to the Lord are one spirit with him and, yeah. and, and then you see it in John 15, the vine and the branch, you know, one organism. And this is all like right in your wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. And and, <clears throat> and you've, you've taught me a lot about that. I mean, we, even in those early days in the late 70s, oh, what you learn through that is how to live from a place of rest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Trusting in the life of another. Trust. Yeah. Sometimes I'll tell people, quit trying to live for God. You need to realize that He lives for you and yeah. through you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, yeah, I learned about, yeah, trusting in the life of another Andy and Christine. Yeah. And I think these two both get this stuff totally. But that, that gave me great hope to go on. Yeah. I could, I could trust yeah. in Him. Norman would always say, um, one of the, I remember the vineyard pastor asked him, well, Norman, I'm just terrible. I'm just awful. I'm an awful, awful person. I can't get yeah. my act together. And he said, oh, sorry. I, no, I'm go an for actor, it. So I was doing that. <laughs> oh, one, wonderful, my dear. Uh, if you're a mess, tell him you're his mess and it's his fault and he better do a better job. <laughs> I thought that was one of the best things I've ever heard because I was a mess. That was one of the best things I'd ever heard in my life. Oh, I can trust you. The heat, he'd always say, keep the heat on God. Yeah. You know, don't yeah. throw it back on yourself to somehow try to improve yourself, fix change and rearrange yourself and other people. Trust him to do that, the Holy Spirit to do that in people. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. And, I, and I know a number of people who have left church because they felt like they couldn't be good enough. Hmm. And this is a huge key that I don't think they understood that, hey, it's not your righteousness, it's the righteousness of another. It, it's Christ's yeah. holiness, righteousness, wisdom. Hmm. And I love your illustration on that subject, Bill. It was, it was Norman's, the, the coffee and the cup. Talk about that one a little bit. He, yeah, well, that first time Norman came to the vineyard, that Ken had him come to the vineyard and uh, Norman said, You're, it's it's like a cup of coffee on the kitchen counter, and we're the cup and he's the coffee. So what's the only function of the human? And what's the function of the cup? And I said, I thought, well, it takes the coffee. He said, yes, receptivity, it receives the coffee. It's not, the cup's not running around in its own power, having a source of its own power and doing something apart from the coffee. The coffee is the power the power to produce, the power to do whatever. So the coffee is is the sanctification, the redemption, the wisdom, yeah. the life. But unfortunately, the cup is trying to be the coffee. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the cup is trying to be like the coffee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, of course, we, we do end up, says, be imitators of Christ. We do end up looking maybe, by God's grace, more Christ-like, but it's really the coffee manifesting through through us mm -hmm. that make us, yep. makes us look more Christ-like. It's not like, you know, so. Right, right. So he would say, bring that cup of coffee illustration up. Mm -hmm. And again, it hit me. I thought, what? You know, and it kind of went off in me, although I didn't quite fully get it. Yeah. And it, then he brought up the branch and the vine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and and he said, <laughs> of course, we, you know, we're, we're the branches, but he made an interesting statement. He said, you are the vine in branch form. I thought, what's that? Because I know he's not saying you're God. Yeah. So, but what he was saying, the real you, the real life, the real sap is yeah. from from the vine and it manifests itself on yeah. the branch. Yeah. So the fruit really is from the vine. It's not the branch trying to produce it apart from the vine, you know. It's, yeah. And Ken Golden gave this great illustration. He said, it's like you're, you're a branch on a tree and the branch is not doing this. Uh, apple. Right. No, it's just. <laughs> right. It's just, just hanging out. Just hanging out. <laughs> being a branch. Exactly. Being a branch. Being a yeah. branch. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Wow. Yeah. yeah. This concept of our union with Christ is something that has been studied by theologians and contemplatives since the very early centuries, right following Christ. Major influencers such as Gregory of Nyssa, Athanasius, Origen, all of these people understood what they called theosis or divinization, that the intermingling of the Holy Spirit with our human spirit, that we become Christ ones. We, we take on the nature of God as he makes his home in us. Our very identity is bound up with the, the identity of God. The effects of the fall are completely overcome. We, have, we are co-heirs with Christ. We inherit his resurrection power just as we Co died with him. We shared in his death. We experienced his resurrection life. We are actually a new creature. Now, I know that's common language f uh, throughout the church, but I think our union with him is not well understood. <clears throat> you hear more and more people from all kinds of different church traditions talking about this in recent decades, which is so wonderful. So, we are the offspring of God. Spirit gives birth to spirit. God is spirit. We are spiritual beings. Our spirit is intertwined with his spirit. Thomas Merton, a big influencer, he describes Christ as our superior self. Uh, one of my favorite quotes from Thomas Merton is, all we have to be is who we already are. Who we already are is in union with Christ. And so, we need to accept that, live into it. Since you are light in the Lord, as Paul says, and as Jesus said, he said to the, the masses gathered on the hill for the Sermon on the Mount, you are the light of the world. We are light. And so it's not just that we've seen the light. We are light bearers. We contain the light. So what, why all the striving? Why all the worry about us being good enough? Not the point is not how good we are. Of course, we get better and better as we live into the reality of our union with Christ. He is our righteousness. Without this understanding, people default to simply following rules, legalism. That's not what life in the Spirit is. It's life in the Spirit is free and it's experiencing the relationship of He who lives in you of the Trinity living in you. So what's the practical outworking of this truth? Well, we rest in God's sufficiency. You know, the, the one comment, Bill quoted Norman Grubb saying, trying is of the devil. Well, you have to be careful about statements like that in isolation. Of course, I get what he means. What he really means is striving is of the devil trying to attain righteousness is of the devil. 
Paul worked harder than all of the other apostles, he says, but it was grounded in knowing that Christ was doing it through him. You can try as hard as you want to, as long as you are at peace with the fact that I'm good with God, I'm one with him, I'm restored to complete fellowship, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's the faith of Christ working through you. He is the fruit bearer and, and we walk with him and that's how we bear fruit. If you want to spend your life worshiping God, this is essential. Because if, if you don't get this, you will be frustrated that you're not good enough. You will be putting your trust in your own ability rather than God's ability. It's a mysterious truth, but it's plainly written there for us throughout the New Testament to see. Jesus said in John 7, Come to me, all you are thirsty, and drink, and living water will burst from within you. Where is the fountain? The fountain is within you. You don't have to wait for the Holy Spirit to come on you to be anointed. It, the fountain is flowing. The river is flowing. And it's not a tiny trickle. It is Christ's all-sufficient nature through you. So, we trust in Christ to live the cruciform life through us, with us, as us. And, you know, if you find your identity in being a Christ one, well, you do what he did. You walk as a child of light. And so you learn to let go of everything, the great kenosis, the, the great letting go, the outpouring of the old self so that you can be in partnership with the divine. We don't grasp our rights and privileges just as Jesus didn't grasp his rights and privileges as God. Uh, we consider the good of the whole of, of everyone around us. We consider the needs of others before our own needs. Uh, we, we don't let pride rule our lives. And the way that you get deeper and deeper understanding of this is simply by meditating quietly before the Lord. Have a contemplative life. You know, this, this word mysterion, it's where we get the word mystic. Anybody who has experiential knowledge of God is a mystic. In the Vineyard Movement, it's a mystical movement, and a lot of people don't use that word, but that's a word that Paul uses many times in the New Testament to describe experiential knowledge of God. That's at the core of what we do in our musical worship. Intimacy with God is all about being one with the mysterion, the Christ in us. You don't climb up to an understanding of this. You sink down and to a place of rest. Let the speaking one, God, speak just by being quiet and by choosing a life that will please him which is, of course, again, part of the cruciform life Jesus showed us is that he wanted to please the Father in everything he did. God will energize you and transform your understanding as you simply give yourself to these truths. Walk at the pace of grace, which you can do when you know that Christ is your life.